It's the final countdown. Primary day is Tuesday in the race for New York City mayor, and some of the rival candidates are now teaming up. The warmth and humidity do not take a break. What to expect by morning? And New York Live has one woman's journey around the world to find the best wines. This is News 4 Now. For June 21st, I'm Adam Cooperstein. If you didn't already vote early, this is your chance to have a voice when it comes to the next mayor of New York City. Primary day is Tuesday, and it comes after more than 191,000 people voted during the early voting period. And in this final push, there's been an unlikely alliance between Democratic candidates trying to improve their chances with the new ranked voting system. Over the weekend, Catherine Garcia and Andrew Yang campaigned together. Yang telling his supporters to rank Garcia second, although Garcia didn't do the same in return. The move appears to be an effort to block Eric Adams, who's been leading the polls. Adams is questioning the timing of this, and the leading progressive candidate, Maya Wiley, says she was offered a chance to take part. Listen, we know America's dog pass. Everything from poll taxes uh, to how we stopped the voting, what we're seeing across the country. And so many people felt that this was uh, symbolic of that. But I'm focused on the future of this city. Look, uh, anytime you're running for office and asking for the people's trust, you know, it's really important that you make sure you're standing up for your principles because people want to know what they are and you have to show them, I think, every day. There are eight main Democratic candidates and two Republican candidates, and polls open at 6 a.m. on Tuesday. And News 4 will have complete coverage of Tuesday's primary. You can find your polling location, everything you need to know about ranked choice voting, by going to NBCNewYork.com or on the NBC4 app. Well, police are hoping you can help them identify two men wanted in connection to a stabbing of a volunteer for the Eric Adams mayoral campaign. They say the volunteer was stabbed on Morris Avenue in the Bronx by a man wearing a red bandana. Police also want to find a man who was with him. He was wearing a sweatshirt with the word privileged on it. The last check, that volunteer who was stabbed was in critical condition, but stable after having surgery. Several mega vaccination sites are soon going to close across New York State. The York College site is the only one closing in the five boroughs. Officials are doing this, though, because of what they say is a concerning, slowing pace of vaccinations. Fans can once again fill City Field in Queens to full capacity as they cheer on the first place Mets. This change comes just in time for Monday's doubleheader against the Atlanta Braves. And the stadium is now allowed to fill as many seats as possible. So that's 40,000 plus. Fans no longer need to show proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test to get in. And social distancing and masks are no longer required. And now a commuter alert. Construction has started on the Brooklyn Bridge to build a new bike lane. The city is warning drivers to find alternate routes into Lower Manhattan. The new bike lane will be two lanes. The goal here is to free up space for pedestrians on the promenade. And there's a big change for drivers. Right turns are not allowed onto the bridge from Tillery Street. Construction on the Brooklyn Bridge is expected to finish in the fall. Well, today is the first full day of summer. Maria, it is starting off hot, humid, and a bit stormy. Today's warmth and humidity definitely lingers through this evening, and it will continue to fuel a few of those showers and thunderstorms yet to come completely through. So through the next few hours into later this evening, that possibility. Then, then by 10 o'clock into midnight, still cloudy, still into the 70s, and in fact, pretty mild and muggy tomorrow still. Near 70 degrees for the low, north and west into the 60s. Long Island, I slip to Eastport also into the mid-60s. So any of these showers and thunderstorms do move out pretty early what you need to keep in mind by tomorrow morning while we have a little bit of a break. We will see another round of showers during the later morning hours, although temperatures will be a whole lot cooler, staying pretty close to those morning lows. How would you like to refine your taste for wine? New York Live is a look at the personal journey for one sommelier. With the year we've had, we could all use a glass of wine or two. So today we're meeting with a wine expert who's going to teach us how to choose the perfect glass. Cha, firstly I have to say that you have a dream job. So many of us love to drink wine, but we would never think to pursue a career in it. How did you get into it? 
Well, it first started with me just traveling the world. I moved to Italy for my MBA. Um, and I actually was always embarrassed because I didn't know what to order when I would go out to eat with my friends and classmates. And so I originally said, okay, enough is enough. Let me start making trips to the vineyards and become a sponge to the environment. But your background is in engineering, right? Yes, I actually am trained as a civil engineer and worked in the industry for 13 years. There's a popular film called Uncorked and it chronicles the journey of an African-American man who wants to become a sommelier. In the film, <laughs> the world of sommeliers seems to be lacking in diversity. So what I want to know is whether or not that's an accurate depiction. And if so, what has your experience been like as an African-American in the field? You know what, his journey is very similar to mine as in I also started in a wine shop. Um, I think that the accuracy of not only the lack of diversity in the industry is also spotlighting us in the industry. So now we're trying to uh, decolonize the idea of wine by allowing all foods. I don't care if you have jerk chicken, I know there's a red wine out there for that, which I love, a Meritage blend. We are in Brooklyn at Tail Feather, owned by Autumn Stanford, so I'm happy to be a collaborator here with her wine list. We're gonna start out with a white from the Finger Lakes. Let's get into the swirl. Okay. I'm afraid to like have you it jump out of afraid. the glass. Next, we open the wine up. Let's go ahead and smell the wine. The most prominent note on this one is what Europeans would normally call petrol. Uh, we would call gasoline. Hmm. Uh, and Riesling tends to smell like you just left, yeah. The gas station. Okay. And it's not a bad thing, it's not off. That actually comes from reason, especially when it's aged a certain way. A lot of people are not necessarily equipped or they don't have the desire to step outside of their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I love what you do because mm -hmm. in educating us about wine, it makes us become more comfortable and more familiar. Yes. And then it allows these wines to become more approachable to us. I hope so. Well, Cha, thank you for everything you do. I've learned so much today. Cheers. Cheers, thanks for coming. It was Bedlam. A year ago this month, parts of New York City were rocked by rioting and looting. Stores from the Bronx to Midtown to Soho gutted by roving mobs taking advantage of the George Floyd protests and the pandemic. The NYPD did make hundreds of arrests, but more than a year later, a great majority of the criminal cases against suspected looters have simply been dropped. Chief investigative reporter Jonathan Deans looked into what has not been done about those who destroyed parts of the city that night. Yo, free vote! Free vote! A year ago, parts of the city were out of control. Crowds were seen smashing storefront after storefront. The mayhem continued night after night. At one point, there was even a so-called looting dance party on the streets of Soho. The mob seemingly pillaging at will. Many were caught on tape, some with faces visible. I got to take all the papers and fonts off this right Even posted live their own videos of their actions those nights. We got the Rolex store. Police far outnumbered and seemingly unprepared. But many arrests were made in Manhattan and along some commercial streets in the Bronx. Videos show how numerous locally owned Bronx stores were ransacked. NYPD data we reviewed shows 118 arrests were made in the Bronx during the worst of the looting. Since then, the NYPD says the DA and courts have dismissed 73 of those cases. 18 remain open, and there are 19 convictions for mostly lesser counts like trespassing, counts which carry no jail time. Those numbers are, to be honest with you, excuse the word, it's disgusting. Jessica Bettencourt owns an eyeglass store which was ransacked. She is vice president of a local merchants association. They brushed everything off to the side, what happened. In Manhattan, NYPD data we reviewed shows there were 485 arrests. 222 cases later dropped. There are 73 convictions, many for lesser counts like trespassing, another 40 cases sent to family court, and 128 remain open. That's not justice. That's selective enforcement. Law enforcement expert and former NYPD Chief of Patrol Wilbur Chapman, critical of the DA's dropping so many looting and burglary cases. If they are so overworked that they can't handle the mission that they're hired for, then maybe they should find another line of work. Sources in the DA's offices tell us in some cases, evidence was simply not strong enough for proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And with the courts closed amid the pandemic, 
there was a huge backlog of cases that was unwieldy for both the courts and prosecutors. The NYPD did set up a task force after the riots to examine videos to separate out suspected rioters from peaceful protesters, similar to what the FBI is doing in making arrests after the Capitol Hill riot. The NYPD says there were tedious follow-up investigations led in part by Deputy Inspector Andrew Arias, where evidence included photos and recovered stolen property. We have to analyze each case individually and see if, in fact, we could prove that the right person had committed the crime. Former Chief Chapman says while the NYPD did some follow-up, he says the data shows the DAs and the courts have not. It allowed people who committed crimes to go scot-free. Bronx DA Darcel Clark declined repeated requests for an interview, as did Manhattan DA Cy Vance. In an internal memo, Vance says there were over 600 commercial burglary arrests, in addition to over 3,500 unindicted felony cases in the pipeline, waiting to move forward in the courts, all on hold because of the pandemic. Before dropping a case, the memo shows his office reviewed defendants' criminal histories and whether police could really place the suspect at the scene and whether the individual caused any damage to the store. Vance told his prosecutors, for many of these commercial burglaries, you will be asked to reduce the initial felony charge to a misdemeanor and to dispose of the case with an eye towards rehabilitation. And he stressed the importance of our continued goal to achieve consistency and equitable treatment in these cases. A court spokesman says decisions to dismiss cases were made by the district attorneys. An application must be made by the DA or, as they've done with hundreds of desk appearance tickets, decline to prosecute them. In the Bronx, some businesses are back, but the scars from the events of a year ago remain. They could do it again because they know that no one is, they're not going to get the, um, the, the right punishment. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you right back here tomorrow.